today is November 7th, 2019. It is 6.52 p.m. I am Brianna Holness conducting a oral history interview for BALSA. We are currently at the University of Florida Levin College of Law in a study room. Please state your full name and where you were born. My name is Rochelle Johnson. I was born in West Palm Beach, Florida, but I grew up in Riviera Beach. Was there a big difference between the two? Absolutely, and that's why I said it. Uh, West Palm Beach is a uh, predominantly white city who has grown to be much more diverse, but uh, Riviera Beach is a predominantly black beachside city, which is rare um, to have a predominantly black city that is beachside. Interesting. So in connection with that, can you tell me about your early childhood and your family dynamic? Absolutely. Um, I definitely had an interesting family dynamic. I was raised by my maternal grandmother. Um, my mom, when I was younger, um, raised me, but then at some point, I would say around seven or eight, she moved out to California. And I'm guessing it was always going to be, you're going to move out there with her. She's going to get settled. But that never happened, and I'm happy it didn't. Um, because I had such a strong bond with my maternal grandmother. I was truly her lap baby. Um, and I was actually really bonded with both of my grandmothers. So I was really bonded with my maternal grandmother, lived with her primarily, but it was almost like a shared custody with them. Yeah. My paternal grandmother, uh, she would drive this blue tempo. And when I would see the blue tempo coming up in the yard, I knew... I was going with my paternal grandma because my maternal grandmother was tired and she needed a break. She needed a break. Um, but, you know, I was, I was um, blessed to grow up in a black community and I'm so protective of the reputation of black communities. I think they are um, talked about with one note um, that all black communities are the same and that's definitely not the case. I went to black elementary school, black middle school, um, more of a 60, 40 minutes for high school, but that high school was started off as predominantly black. Um, and then we got a magnet program there. So I went, grew up in a black church. I grew up going to the rec center and being a cheerleader and selling concessions at the rec center and being in a Girl Scout troop. So I was just really, really blessed to grow up really loved and really, um, I almost don't want to use this proverb because it is overused, but truly I was the product of It Takes a Village. Um, I have so many warm memories of growing up in the black community, but I will say when I was going through my growing up stages, I didn't appreciate it. I didn't, at that moment, I just felt like an awkward kid. Right. You know, I didn't, at that moment, have this deep thought like, oh, this is wonderful. I'm growing up in the black community. I dealt with all of the growing pains that kids go through. You go through bullying, you go through community, you go through friendships. But I know we'll get there later in the interview, but looking back on it and comparing it to the work that I do now and the kids that I work with now, I truly was loved. And um, so I was fortunate. We definitely had some of the current issues that we see. Um, the drug issue did come into some of the neighborhoods within Riviera Beach, um, but I was shielded a lot from that due to the love of um, my church and my family. So I know you said you had a loving family, but tell me a little bit about your household, how your grandma ran her house. Was oh, she strict. That's a good <laughs> question. Honestly, my grandmother was not strict. She could have been more strict. So I did I didn't come from, you know, that kind of background where um, you know, you say something and you knew you couldn't say it. In fact, because of that, my grandmother was very much forceful when she knew I want to be a lawyer that I had to be a lawyer because everything between me and her was a negotiation as far as I had to give her three or four reasons why she could see it differently. So um, if we, for, I'll give you one example. Her big thing on Saturdays was do your chores before you 
watch cartoons, right? right. Everybody loves Saturday <laughs> cartoons. And what I wanted her to do was just tell me everything I need to do. But she wanted me to have to come back, do this one thing, come back, do this one thing, come back, do this one thing, come back. Grandma, give me the list. Grandma, please. give me the list. <laughs> Let me prioritize what I need to do first. So maybe I can watch. Right. Maybe I'm gonna do two things at once. Um, so she she grew up um, with me constantly trying to negotiate things and I know this is not the time to go into it, but it's so interesting. I didn't really have this revelation till just a second. <laughs> you know, me being a guardian litem attorney, our big thing is you are protecting the voice of the child. Right. And I grew up in, the, in a home where my voice mattered. I wasn't shut down quickly for having an opinion. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's just a tendency among people who know they're going to be lawyers, mm. but... I think that a lot of at least black kids who grow up in the home who know they want to be lawyers always have that like tit for tat with their parents. Really? Always. I I can tell you it was rare. Uh, my family just said, you are spoiling her. You know, you need my to mom. just bop her in the mouth and get it over with. You just, if you just do it that one or two times, you wouldn't have the problems that you had. And she honestly needed to do that a few times. Oh, I got and, it a few times. <laughs> right. She, she honestly needed to do that, if I'm being honest. Um, but I definitely grew up knowing, knowing, sorry, that my voice counted. That's a good feeling. Yeah, I think it's a great feeling for anybody, honestly. But... Knowing that you were heard when you got into school mm -hmm. at an early age, do you feel like that transcribed into school? Um, how was school? I will tell you, uh, in talking to friends now, I realized that I had a very special experience that I hear that other people across the state did not have. And let me explain why. For some reason... At the time when I went to elementary school, they were doing some type of initiative where they went into all of the elementary schools and tested us for gifted. Did they do that when you guys were at elementary? It wasn't a test, so I think you'd go in with all of your classmates, and if you if it looked like you were performing a little better than them, then they'd be like, hey, mom, we want to test her for gifted. But it wasn't like they test everybody. This was some type of special initiative that I think maybe... Um, our communities were not being streamlined into that. And they were, you know, thinking that we, we had people that, of course we do, of course, that were gifted, but were not getting the opportunities that we should have. So they made it a, a priority. And so got tested for gifted, moved schools, and then had this like core group of people that I literally followed through middle school. But the beautiful thing of it is, is that it didn't take me out of my community. And it's not as though I went from being into a predominantly black community, but now I have to go to a predominantly white community to be a gifted. They made sure those classes were right there in our community. And that was very affirming because right. I've heard a lot of people who got who went into gifted programs, they were transported somewhere they made sure those programs were available for us in our communities. And I don't think that was typical across the state. Yeah, it, does, I don't, it doesn't sound like it. Because even the fact that they tested everyone mm -hmm. is different. And they may not have tested everybody, but I know they, they did a special look. Right. And it, it pulled several people that, honestly, I'm still friends with to today. Like, we just started following each other right. through middle school, through high school, through college, um, reconnecting, and still connected with them till until today. So, you're, you basically went through middle school, high school with these people. Was there a cutoff at college? Like, did y'all disperse? We did not go to the same colleges, but I will, let me go back to high school really quickly, because um, I went to Suncoast High School. Um, and in that program, I did international baccalaureate program. So that allowed me, if you got that diploma, you were able to get a scholarship and have a full, full ride to a state school at the time that I graduated. I'm going to tell you 1996. I know that's, 
You That's how I was born. Okay, I knew you were gonna say something. <laughs> Something offensive like that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I just want to make you laugh. Um, yeah, in 1996, the year you were born, uh, <laughs> you actually got a full ride. Now, I know that, um, what is it called? Bright Futures has right. totally changed now. But Completely. back then, Bright Futures, if you got the International Baccalaureate Program diploma, you got a full ride to school. Um, so... I feel like that was an answer to my grandmother's prayers because one another blessing that I had is that I never recall not knowing I was going to college. And I realized that's also not something that everybody gets as a part of their growing up. I don't recall anyone sitting down with me and saying, you're going to college. It was right. just always the expectation. Um, but of course, me being naive, I don't know how you pay for college. You know, I wasn't one of these people that was signing up for all of the scholarships because I knew that's what you needed to do. Um, I, we, did, we did definitely um, qualify for FAFSA and for those type of grants. My, I guess you would call my household um, lower middle class or upper lower class, whatever right. that financial dynamic is. So we qualify for those additional uh, funding sources and then thank God for um, Bright Futures. And so I got to go into school as a sophomore and save a year. That's, that's a lot of money that you say. Yes, you. yes. So what school did you end up going to? Now, I don't know if you want to hit pause, but I went to Florida State. I went to Florida State as well. Awesome. awesome. So I'm go seminal. Go. <laughs> You felt the connection, yes. So how was campus back then? Because obviously I was there, right. but I'm I, sure the dynamic. I, I think it's honestly the same. To be honest with you, um, Tallahassee is just a special place when it comes to diversity. And I don't put that on Tallahassee as much as I do putting it on the number of black families that have matriculated to the area and the fact that you have a thriving HBCU there. Like, I don't know what Tallahassee would be without FAMU. And I think because it has a thriving HBCU, it creates without Florida State knowing it, a level of accountability to their black students. This is true. So I did not experience racism on campus or anything like that. I enjoyed, enjoyed my tenure there. Um, I enjoyed being I enjoyed being at a football school who was winning um, at the time. Say that right now. I know but. that's what I, <laughs> I I I enjoyed being at a football school that was winning. Um, the year that I left, we won the national championship. I I enjoyed that energy, um, and I also had a black professor um, who took me under her wing and actually had us. I was an English major with the emphasis in creative writing. And um, she had us write a paper as if we were presenting a PhD dissertation. Now, I know it was not that big a deal, but back then it felt huge. Right. Um, it felt like, wow, I'm doing a 20 page paper. And she took us over to FAMU to present it at one of their somethings. I don't Convent, know. One of those seminars. So, one of those yeah. seminars. And just, just having that beautiful opportunity to be challenged to do something totally outside of the box was a great experience. So how do you feel like being on campus and you're a first generation college student, correct? Kind of. Okay. So, um, and I love how you just eased into that. That was good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kind of. My parents had some college. My grandmother, I, my grandmother had an AA. Okay. My mom had some college. My father, I believe, had an AA. He died when I was 13. Oh. So th that's not one of the questions I right. got to ask him and didn't even think to ask my grandmother before she passed. Like, how much college did, did dad get? get? You know, that's not a question that you ask. Right. Um, but yeah, he got some college. Um, and then my extended family, which... 
we are very close. Like, I have cousins who are like sisters to me. Same. Yeah. Uh, my sister cousin. Is, exactly. Or my, bro- or my brother cousin, mm-hmm. you know. Um, they had gone to college. So even though it was not my mom, dad, immediate family, I had within my family people who had gone to college. Some, some sort of support. So the university lifestyle wasn't anything new. Like, you had it heard was, about though. it. It was, though. I had heard about it, but it was it was still new to me. Okay. Yeah. So how do you feel like you handled the dynamic of, while Tallahassee is very small, I'm sure compared to Rivera Beach. Right. It's smaller compared to Rivera Beach, but once you get on campus, you just feel like it campus kind of swallows right. you up. Right. So how do you how did you deal with that dynamic? That's a good question. Could you? So, I definitely was a self conscious college student. You know, even though looking back now on it, I know. Nobody was thinking about you. <laughs> I still had that kind of self-consciousness about me. Um, so I would say it was a season of growing pains because, remember, I'm grandma's lap baby. This is my first time away from grandma. Right. I did stay in the dorm. And when I say first time away from grandma, for a long term, I did summer camps and stuff like that that was a week or whatever I stayed in the dorm and I got on my roommate's nerves because there were times I was crying I was so homesick and you can laugh Mm, I was homesick too but this was my first time living away from her Uh, where my shelter came in a little bit is that her sister lived in town that's very lucky. Yes. So so I had Sunday church with her sister. Sunday dinner. And then I had Sunday dinner. I'm jealous. And the church that I went to there, they had college stuff. And it wasn't a lot that I did, but at least I, I didn't go just totally alone. And I had a couple friends that I knew who went there, one in particular, that kind of gave me that cushion of, I know somebody I can call and be like, you want to go here, you want to do this. So I want to be totally alone. So while you were on campus, did you join any organizations that kind of buffered your transition? I did. I I have always been, um, and this is not a professional term to put on such a serious oral history tape, but I have always been a me five me person. Like I, I, I never really joined the sorority. I joined the club. I would join clubs, but I was very flexible with. I'm here for a year and then I'm trying something else. Right. At least in my college years. Okay. Um, so I can't say that I identified with one group. Now there was a group on campus. I'm called Sisters. I'm a sister. There was one group on campus that I called Sisters, and I did do that. And then, of course, my church had a college group. Um, my my roommate, when I got into my last year of school, she was a torchbearer. So I got to do a lot more games that last year, okay. hanging out with her. Um, and then just just enjoying, just really enjoying just Tallahassee and all that that is. So I, I think that's a great transition. So how, if any, did you deal with the transition from Tallahassee to Gainesville? So I didn't do an immediate transition. Talk me through it. Yes. And again... It's funny looking back on my life and doing this was kind of eye opening when I was thinking about it because none of these things when I was in them did I do and I don't remember doing a lot of deep thought. So my last year at Florida State, I do not know why it did not come to me that you need to be studying for the LSAT. 
Maybe because I did a three-year track, so everything was moving so quickly for me. Instead of doing that four-year track, probably by that fourth year would it, you know, hey, you need to do... But everything was moving so quickly for me to get everything done in three years that by my third year, I still don't know until this day why I didn't look at that third year and say, you need to study for the LSAT and start applying for law school. What I did instead was I had a cousin-in-law who was um, pretty high up in journalism, and he invited me to do an internship for NABJ that summer. So I went off and did a newspaper internship for a summer, got paid, and it was a paid internship, and got to do NABJ in Seattle, and he wanted me to consider doing journalism instead of law, but that didn't take me off of the legal track. I went home, I worked for a year, studied for the LSAT exclusively, and applied for law school exclusively. And that year, my grandmother died. Wow. Yes. A month before law school started. Life coming full circle. And this is grandma who I cried for when I went to Florida State. This is grandma who, who said, raised me. you're going to law school, so we got to make this list. We are literally at her bedside, and someone tells her, Rochelle can't be a lawyer, and she stops them and says, Rochelle is going to be a lawyer, and within a few days of her saying that, she passed away. And I know that's like a... Wow, like a, you, that's the moment you see in movies. Yes. But that happened to me. That happened to me. Someone told her, Rochelle cannot be a lawyer. And, and of all that was going on with her at that moment, it, it's beautiful now yeah. thinking about it. All that's going on with you at that moment where you, she knew she was about to pass away. I was not accepting of that. I'm like, Grandma, no, you're going to get better. And she told me I'm not. And so all that is going on with you at that moment of, as a human being, facing your own mortality. And for you to have enough love for your granddaughter that you say, facing, I I hate to repeat that, but you're facing your own end of life I'm leaving here I'm about to transition what does that mean for me you have enough love for your granddaughter to stop that person who said that to make sure she's clear on what she needs to do and call the preacher and tell the preacher you need to make sure she goes to law school Was was that a heavy burden for you? It was not. Okay. I did think about it. I did think about whether I could do UF law without my grandmother. Whether I, I thought about whether I could enjoy life without my grandmother. Whether I could be me without my grandmother. Because if anybody knew me, and I'm talk I'm talking about for real, like if my family was sitting here, they're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> It was Rochelle and her, and the way I said it back then, grandmother is very proper. Right. The way my heart said it was grandma. Right. It was Rochelle and her grandma. So that was right. She she passed away on such a significant date. She passed away on July 4th. Wow. Yes, 2000. We were claiming time, honey. Yes, and and now I'm having to... Six weeks later, four weeks later, you know, make a decision if I am going to come on to UF. How how was that process for you? Because, I mean, I could imagine I was in shambles and I was going from undergrad right into law school. So your experience and mine is actually similar, but at a different time. So I know that the the uh, the current phrase for this is FOMO, fear of missing out. I had that growing up. And I heard about some people in my similar situation um, that who were blessed to get the Virgil Hawkins Scholarship. I am one of his scholarship recipients. Wow. Um, That's why you telling me what a significant day this is 
um, means a lot to me right. because I am one of his um, recipients of, of that scholarship. They had a, I don't know what you would call it, a preview summer of four weeks for some of his scholarship recipients to come stay right here on campus and attend. It might have only been two weeks. It might have felt like four weeks, but it was two to three weeks. And we will actually go through different phases of what we will be doing in law school, especially if you were first generation law school. That's different. And I heard about a couple people doing this. Now, in my mind, I never even thought about, oh, this is what they're doing to help you because you need extra help. In my mind, I was like, why do they get to go and I don't get to go? Right. And I got to the phone and was like, I want to come. Mm-hmm. Thank God I did. Because having those relationships built through that group, like I went there at the beginning of the summer, came home, my grandmother died. If I did not have those relationships, it would have been much harder for me to come. But because I did, my decision making was this. I know she wants me to go on and do this, one. And two, if I wait for another class, I'm going to have to build new relationships with people that I may not have the emotional energy to do that with. This is true. So let me go ahead and connect with these people who already know me happy, already know me cheerful, already know me as fun before I have to go now and meet new people and I won't be on that emotional level. Exactly. Your emotion, you would have been drained. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you can give me my time right now because you've Mm -hmm. seen me at my best. Exactly. You're going to give me my time now when some days I have a good day, I'll be fine. Some days I have a bad day, you'll understand. Exactly. So my last interview that I did with Miss Cash Jackson, she did the program as well. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me about it and I was pleasantly surprised not so much now because I wish we had it (laughs) but I think it it worked out well because do you feel like that preparation by them helped you any in law school or I'm gonna tell you I it gave me two things it gave me people that I knew as far as students and professors like Dean Reed who used to be a dean here, was one of the professors who was in that class. And I remember, um, I remember reading a case, we were, and we, we were sitting around a table similar to this one, this oval table. And him, he or somebody else who was conducting that particular session said, you did a great job analyzing that case. Keep doing that. I don't remember anything else about the classroom sessions except for that one moment. And I needed that one moment because when I then came back a few months later and I'm sitting in an auditorium with 200 kids and we're reading the practice, my mind, all of a sudden, everybody's smarter than me. And that's not that's not the case. Right. But that's where it we we can go within ourselves to feel like everybody in the room is smarter than I am when 75% of the room is also feeling like everybody in the room is smarter, smarter than, than them as well. That I think it's funny that you say that because when we were talking about this interview process, my question that I wanted to ask was how did you deal with coming from undergrad? I think all of us come from undergrad. When I was an undergrad, I... I thought I was the it, okay? I wasn't worried about anything. I was like, okay, I have these engagements that I have to do. I do that. My schoolwork was done. I was getting good grades, and I got to law school, and I was like, my confidence is shot. So, like, how did you deal with that? I think I'm still dealing with it because when you're in the classroom and it seems like everybody knows what's going on, and you may know a little bit of what's going on, but then they ask a question, and you're like, my head wasn't even there right. like, I wasn't even thinking that right but how if any did you deal with that yeah. portion of it so you know my first year was just really us in survival mode um I was just and it was good for me the structure of law school was good for me having somewhere to go get up 
every day. You're going to class, you're sitting there. You might not be retaining anything, but you're going to sit there, you're going to listen. That routine was good for me in a year of grief. And then where when I was starting to get over some of just the raw pain of grief, it took me a few years, but some of that I did get over while I was here. Um, I started struggling with my confidence as well. And I think, and in fact, this was one of the things on my heart to say, when we talk about one of the things that UF has as a, as a campus, UF Law, it's the spirit of competitiveness. And I even work with students now that I still hear that that's still a part of, it is. of the culture um, where if you don't just feel like you're trying to get the right answer, you, it's, you feel like everybody has the right answer but you. And, and that's a cultural thing. I think where I was, when I was able to step out of that is by finding my niche. My niche was not in the class discussion and theory and the Socratic method, you know, the whole time my knees were knocking like, please don't call on me. <laughs> but I, I found my niche in trial team. Um, that's where I really started to blossom. And then when I took trial practice, I, I got the book award in trial practice. So I started to blossom in the practical, where it was no longer just reading a case and talking about the theory. Because now that I'm an attorney, I can tell you, I, when, I, when we were reading cases in law school, I didn't understand the purpose of the case like I do now. Like now, if I was in law school after being an attorney since for as long as I've been, I understand now you're just reading the case for the precedent. You're just reading the case for the rule and it would have taken the pressure off. Right. But when we were prepping in law school, you're trying to remember facts. every single fact and what color shirt did she have on and was it polka dot and did she have on a yellow skirt? And now I get that stuff wasn't needed. But part of the reason we don't get that is because for so many of us, we are first law school students, first generation law school students. Right. So we don't have people to sit down with us and to tell us when you're reading a case, you're looking for the rule. Find the rule in that case and keep it moving. Find the rule in that case and keep it moving. Um, we just don't have those secrets. And I think that's a great word, secrets, because mm -hmm. A lot of our classmates obviously come from generations and generations of lawyers who can tell them that, but how do you feel like, or I guess I should say, what did it mean to you to be a black law student at UF Law at your time here? It felt like a privilege. Um, not a privilege so much as I didn't belong or somebody was doing me a favor, not that way. But I was aware of the history. I was aware of the history, not just of UF law, but of UF. Mm -hmm. I had cousins who went to UF and I knew their experiences. In fact, I had two cousins who did a first year at UF and then transferred to HPCUs. Wow. And they're one is 20 years older than me, the other is 15. So I knew the culture of UF for blacks, not just talking about the law school, had a challenging history. I did know that. And so to be here, and especially being a Virgil Hawkins scholar, um, it felt like an honor. I think an honor is a better word than privilege because privilege is almost like you're allowing me in. It felt like an honor um, to be here. What I didn't like, um, and, I, and this is important for this oral history, is I came in at the time when affirmative action was really being debated, really being debated. In fact, I came in at a time in which there was um, so much of a debate over affirmative action that we would come to class and 
people would have left anonymous letters on our desk about affirmative action and what that meant for race. And it felt very uncomfortable. And that's saying it lightly. Right. It, some days you felt attacked without anyone being in your face because they did this anonymous letter. And, and I cannot tell you, it was more than one time where someone would write an anonymous letter about affirmative action and, and, and they based it on race. And so there, this, there became this culture for a little bit of me feeling like my non-black peers, more particularly my white peers, assumed I got into UF because of affirmative action, that I didn't earn my seat here, that I got here because of affirmative action. And that was offensive to me because UF wasn't even the best school I got accepted to. I was also accepted to Emory Law. But I didn't go to Emory Law because remember, I had all this history of this past year, right? My grandmother died. I had... I was blessed to get a full scholarship here, which I did not get a full scholarship to Emory Law. Right. And I had this core group of people I had already met. So it was all these other factors drawing me to UF. And I had peers thinking I was here because of affirmative action, not because I was blessed to be Phi Beta K Kappa, not because I was blessed to be Summa Cum Laude, not because of my grades at FSU, not because of any of that. That was, that was offensive. Um, but I also had white students who, um, who would pull me aside and have some real deep conversations with me and ask me, how did this environment make me feel? And so I don't want to put paint this picture that it was this us versus them. There were genuine white students and I can... I wish I could remember some of their names, but I can remember them asking me, how do you feel when people leave these letters on your desk? And how does it make you feel when this is happening, these things are being said? And they just sat there and listened. And they listened genuinely. It wasn't listen to like we do kind of now today in social media culture, listen to respond. I can remember them pulling me out of class and just listening. And so when I was here, it was this, it was for, I don't know how long that went on, but it marked me significantly that this is not what I have experienced in college. It marked me. I remember as a part of this discussion, um, blow up letters being put on the stairwell. And some of them were in defense. Some of them were in defense of students who looked like me, and some of them were not. And I can't say they were not. They were in defense of diversity being diversity of thought and not just diversity of race or gender. And it even was it even put tension between some of the social groups on campus. Um, one of the social groups was Jumba. They're still here. Right. And, and I remember that small tension starting within that group, too. Um, not within that group, but just feeling like, do we want to go to their events? Or, da, 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 you know. So when I went through that time and that discussion was happening, um, it, it started to bring tension here that made me feel just a little bit because I never want to discount anybody's story and I hope this statement doesn't do that like wow this is what they must have felt like in the 60s mm -hmm. it felt reminiscent of that it was not that they went through so much hostility but to have that type of 
anonymous, leaving notes, making comments, tension within our peers, assumptions about our qualifications, it felt reminiscent of that. I'm floored. You weren't expecting that. I'm floored because my last interview, I think she's older than you. And she, obviously, she had a different type of experience, but nothing about race came up in her experience. And now that I'm talking to you and I'm like, progression means the you Well, remember the better. trigger. Affirmative action. The trigger was this became a national discussion on affirmative action. So maybe at the season she was here, there was not that trigger. Right. But there was that trigger for the season my class was here. Now, did we let that mean, did that mean we didn't have a diverse group of friends? No. Did that mean we, we felt in danger? No. Did that mean we felt like we couldn't succeed here? No. But it was reminiscent of those old discussions. It was. I'm, my heart's heavy. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you heavy. My heart's heavy. And I wish that the video could see my face. I'm, <laughs> I'm not making light of this. But that was the trigger. Right. That was the discussion at that time. And it forced us as students to have some hard conversations. And I don't remember if that lasted a semester or that lasted a year. But... For me, when I heard my UF undergrad students talk about how much they love UF, I realized that they had a total different experience in, in undergrad than they were having in law school during that year. Right. That was a tough year for us. And, and I can't say it was just a tough year for black students. That was just a tough year. And the law school is so much smaller than the main campus. So you can emerge yourself in the main campus and not even know about the things that are going on around you. It forced us to have some hard conversations as students. It really did. And what I'm sharing with you, I shared with students who pulled me to the side and asked me questions and asked me how we felt about, you know, the letters being left on our desk or the discussion. And it might have been a semester, but it was such a poignant <laughs> semester it that stayed with you. It's, of course. Till to, to this day. But at the same time, I have um, trial team classmates who, um, classmates is not the right word to say, teammates that I'm Facebook friends with, um, I have students that, oh my goodness, we thought so differently. I, I don't want to say her name on this recording, but she was so high up in the Federalist Society. She is, she is still a close friend to me. Um, and we think so differently on a few matters. Um, and I was also one of those people where I was definitely, and I know we're going to get to black community, I was definitely involved in, in salsa, but I also did salsa. And I have no ladder roots. Like, what am I doing in salsa? No ladder roots at all. <laughs> I'm up in salsa because, you know, I had a close friend who was in salsa. And I was like, well, let me come over here and see what you guys are doing. Right. And so I would do a few salsa um, meetings. I know that there were um, Blacks here who also did, and I might say it wrong, I'm sorry, Caribsa? Carib Law. Car Carib Law. Yeah. Um, so, and my study group was very diverse. We had three Latinos, um, three Blacks. Um, so we were just very, very diverse. So I got to also get the experience of what Latin fraternities were doing because sometimes we would go to their parties and see that type of thing. So... It did not stop relationships from forming. Um, and some of them have like been lifetime relationships. Yes. I love that. So I hope you don't feel heavy anymore. No, it's lightening up. Now. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't want, want you to feel heavy. Um, but how 
how was the relationship among black students on campus at that time, especially with the issues of affirmative action? Was there a sense of solidarity amongst you guys? Yes, but we're still people, right? So BALSA was definitely like a pull and point for all of us to come together. The uh, activities we had with that were great, but we're still people. So you're still going to have people you hang out with more than others. You know, um, if there's a such thing as cool kids in law school, I probably wasn't a cool kid. Um, But I was the person who was friends with a lot of different groups. But, you know, I'm remembering those people now and there was no one I felt like I couldn't go up and talk to. Even if I didn't know you, know you, I can ask you something. I can, and and that's a good feeling. So we did feel a connection with one another. We had a lot of activities, which was great. Um, If you wanted to get out your house and do something, there was things to do. A diversity of things to do from, I remember we used to have, I don't know if you guys still do this, spoken word nights. We used to do spoken word nights and game nights. And I felt like, and I don't know why I felt this way. I needed to go to everything. (laughs) So I went to a lot. You met a lot of people, I'm sure. But there was a lot to do. And that helped us stay connected. Um, But, you know, I think sometimes solidarity doesn't mean you're not going to have people you're closer to than others. Another another way that I found community within our black community here is actually me and another young lady, her name is Lori Nazri. Um, we actually had a Friday night Bible study in each other's houses for girls, law students only. So that also gave us a place of community because we were praying to pass these classes and life was happening too right you know their their parents were something right. or you heard your sister or something happened on campus that rubbed you the wrong way mm-hmm. so it was just a good friday night time to come in a safe place have those conversations privately we kept each other's confidences what was said at the at our apartment stayed, stayed in our apartments and we pray for one another. And that was like 12, 10 to 12 black females from the class of 2003 and 2004. Wow. That, that's, I know they have a Christian legal society. I think it's. No, yes. But we were not, not them. that. We were not them. This is just something Lori and I did in our humble abodes. I mean, they were humble. I was living in a studio. She at least had a one bedroom loft. <laughs> and I, they were in the living room they, and your room. <laughs> I mean, and we would have snacks and refreshments and community. Wow. So, as far as community goes, how many black professors were here when you were here, if you can remember? It was probably more than I'm remembering, okay? Um, there were probably four to five. But the ones I remember the most, and I want to give them honor by naming them, was Dean Reed, okay. Professor Nunn, who I know is still here, and Professor Jacobs. She's still here, too. Yes. Um, those were the three. And I actually was blessed to go with Professor Nunn and Dean Reed. And actually, Professor Nunn was Dean Nunn at one time, but Professor Nunn and Dean Reed um, to South Africa. And that was another place Black students found community every single summer for I don't know how many years they did that they would take and this was not limited to black students my Latino friends came too they would take a group of students who ever wanted to go to South Africa and this was very important because this was after the apartheid and we were going through their newly created constitution we were in their parliament we were meeting with their lawyers these were these were Lawyers who had 30 years been separated before, 30 years before been separated by black, colored, white. And we are hanging out with them for a summer. 
it was really amazing and that and that's why I have to name Professor Nunn I have to name Dean Reed they they gave us that opportunity and once they planted that bug and some some of us that bug has not left right they're still planting well Professor Nunn and Professor Jacobs are still planting that bug trust me wonderful but do you feel like those relationships with your black professors made it more tolerable to be here I should say but my 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 time here wasn't bad. Right. Don't it, it was? I hope all those good memories let lets you hear the balance. Like mm-hmm. we definitely had some hard conversations and hard moments that we didn't want to have. Right. right. And law school is law school. Like I don't care if I was at Howard Law. Law school is going to be law school. So on that on its own, it's going to be challenging. Um, but they. They engaged us um, seeing them be where we wanted to go was very encouraging. They were welcoming but extremely professional all the time all the time um, and some of my best classroom moments because uh, I didn't take a class from Dean Reed. I don't think I took one from Professor Nunn. I don't think I got the opportunity, but I knew him from the South Park and being on campus. I just don't remember. But some of my best classroom moments were definitely with Professor Jacobs because I was in my last year at that time. So it wasn't taking her for a core class. Right. Something you actually it was, enjoyed. It was taking her for an elective. And I took her woman's incarceration class and another class. And the conversations around that class was just amazing. And I've, and I've been able to see um, Professor Nunn since then and Professor Jacobs and just to see people that, you know, you looked up to and actually they can see that you are doing your element too is really good. Right. Well, you kind of walked me to my next question. All right, good. So can you talk to me about graduation, bar prep, passing the bar, just early career things? While I was in law school. So as far as just my own experience with preparation for bar prep, um, I took... I, I did the traditional take the summer and really, really focus. Um, for career, it sounds so similar to my last year at Florida State. I didn't walk out of here with a job. And that bog- this time it bothered me. Before, it, was, it just didn't click that I should have been studying for the LSAT. Um, this time, I can't say that I had been applying a ton of places, but... I chose to go to uh, South Africa my first summer. My second summer, I worked at a law firm here in town, but it was not a law firm I wanted to get a job at. I just didn't like the area of law they were practicing. And I think that was my struggle, like where I truly understand not everybody gets the gift of knowing what they want to do since they were a little girl or little boy all the way up to now. Um, when once we got that I was going to law school settled and that was nothing to settle. It just that's what I was going to do. I did struggle with the area of law. When I came in thinking I was going to do one area, which made no sense. It, fit, it doesn't even fit my personality. I came in thinking I was going to do entertainment law. That is so not me. I wish this, video, I wish this was a video just so they could even see how laid back I'm dressed right now. Um, that's, you know, that's for the young lady who is going to be dressed to the nine every single every day. day. And that is just so not me. I don't know what I thought that was, but it's not me. Maybe I watched Jerry Maguire too many times. I don't know. But I came in thinking that would be my area. And that lasted for five seconds. And... 
but I didn't leave knowing what, but what I did leave with because of trial team and because of trial practice is that I needed to be in a courtroom. I had a professor, he wasn't a professor, he was a local attorney. His name is Bill Hoppy. He was our trial team coach. And he said, Rochelle, I don't care what you do, you need to be in front of a jury. You need to be in front of a jury. So I didn't know how to get there as far as what job I was going to be. I just knew I needed to be in the trial room setting. And I forgot to say this too, while I was in law school, I was also fortunate to do an externship at the Florida Supreme Court. Wow. Now that was, that was a blessing in that it was a special externship based on the Unified Family Court. Normally, the people who go to that externship, they are like top 3% of the class, all of those other qualifications. I did not have those qualifications, but I had the, that interest, if that makes sense. Right. Um, so it was a special created externship. So doing that though, I also knew I needed to be in a courtroom because being at the floor Supreme Court, wow, what an honor. What an honor to be Justice Parente's at Stern. Mm -hmm. But I didn't enjoy sitting in an office all day. I didn't enjoy just writing briefs all day. That, that didn't, so that let me know I couldn't do transactional work or doing private law where I was going to have to wait three or four years before I got into the courtroom was not going to be my cup of tea. So I saw Bill Cerrone, the local state attorney, at an event. I cannot tell you, except for by now you probably know I'm a believer and it had to be God. I cannot tell you what made me go up to him. But I went up to him and said, hi, my name is Rochelle and I'm a law student. And I'm just curious if you have any jobs available. This was not pre-planned. It's not like I went to this event and I had resumes and I knew I was gonna do this. This blows me away, honestly. <laughs> like when I think about this in my memory bank, I'm like, what? You did that. I went up to him, asked him if they had any jobs. Because when I was looking on websites, a lot of state attorney's offices don't post their jobs on their website. Right. He said, give me a call. Send me your resume. And I was hired in three to four weeks. And that was your first job? That was my first job as a prosecutor. And he hired me before I took the bar. And I had to go to him and ask him for special permission. I said, I just need to really focus on the bar. Like after I saw how intense the study was, I asked them, I said, could you please delay my start date for a month? Because I did not want to not pass the bar and then my job be in jeopardy. Right. So he did give me that grace. And I, I, I took the full two months straight up, go to the coffee shop, go to the library, Books a million, they, they probably knew me as when I parked because I would come there at 10 o'clock in the morning, don't leave till that night. I might take a two hour break. So yes. Wow. And and I was I was blessed to, to pass the bar on the first try. And and I don't give myself credit for that. That was God. I mean, it seems like you got your first job just by being you, which is amazing. But I know we hear so much about the Gator Network. Yes. Did it work for you? Did you ever try it? So I have heard, I have heard how amazing the Gator Network is. I can probably point to me getting the externship at the Florida Supreme Court based on the Gator Network because that had nothing to do with my credentials. That based on someone knowing about that opportunity, not being able to do that opportunity herself and recommending me. So that I would say would be the Gator Network. Um, I do know that people who I come across when they find out I go to UF Law, if they went to UF Law, that is a starting point. I just have not 
seeing the Gator Network as a part of my story. It may become a part of my story, but I will say some opportunities like this one to do oral history. That was the Gator Network. Um, Doing career day last year, I had a colleague who I was her supervisor. She used to be the career services assistant director here, Erin Carr. She's no longer here. And that was the Gator Network. Come over to help people about the Guardian Lighting Program. So there have been opportunities, yes, that the Gator Network has opened up for me. Okay. So just besides from the Gator Network, did you feel comfortable connecting with alumni who weren't black or did race matter for you at all? Or was it just right time, right place, right person? Hey, I'm Rochelle. How, how does that? I never had the expectation that I was going to be able, especially in Florida, uh, to, to get a job with people who were my same race. So I guess I never thought about it that way. Um, if we were maybe in a DC or Atlanta or places like that, then then yes. Um, I know of just a, a few um, all black law firms there. They definitely do exist. They definitely do exist. Um, so for me, I did have the expectation that I would be working with people who were non-black and my employers would be non-black. Um, I didn't see that as a barrier. I saw it as reality. This is true. So what advice do you have for current black students at UF in particular? The advice I have is to run your own race. That's really my, when we think about When we talked about earlier about UF being competitive, when I look at the mistakes I've made in my life professionally as an attorney, it is because I started looking at someone else running their race and thought that was the race I was supposed to run. And I'm gonna be very transparent here. Um, I started out as a prosecutor here in Gainesville But I always thought that the way to know that you made it in law was to be in a firm. I thought that was the sign that you have arrived. You are at a large law firm. And I was actually offered a job at a law firm. And I did not enjoy it. And when I'm looking back between my experience here and then, I'm like, you were thriving at the state attorney's office. You were in your element. You were in your niche. That is who you are. You are a public interest attorney. You are the attorney that enjoys the grind, the in court four to five days a week grind. That is who you are. Um, You might not drive the Ferrari doing that, but that's who you are. And so I went through a couple of jobs until I really figured that out. I even took a year off of, um, no, it's longer than that, three years, two and a half years <laughs> away from practicing law and did project management work, was making a, a lot more money than I make as a public interest attorney, but was not happy until I found my way back to public interest law. That's what I'm doing now as a supervisory attorney for the Guardian Lighting Program. Been here for 10 years. And um, and that's huge. Like 10 years and a place lets you know you found something. You found a passion. Um, the biggest mistakes I've made professionally is when I started looking at other people running their race. Run your own race, even in law school. You don't have to be on moot court because that's what they say. You don't have to do law review because that's what they say. You don't have to do trial team because Rochelle came and did an interview and she said she loved trial team. Um, There are just 
I believe we are all created in the image of God, but then God made us all unique. For a reason. For a reason. And that that really is the advice. When, is to run your own race. If you don't like that area of law, you don't have to do it. It's Stay so many way. other areas of law. If you don't like that extracurricular activity, you don't have to do it. Trust me, you will get a job faster. If you love nature, going out and cleaning up Payne's Prairie every Saturday and putting that on your resume and them seeing the consistency and the passion and the drive, then you will be on moot court. Run your own race and be at peace with that. Don't worry about it. Because it's really it. okay. So can you tell me a little bit more about the work you do now? Sure. Um, I, I started as a program attorney at the Guardian Lighting Program 10 years ago. Um, was promoted to become a senior attorney and then promoted to be a supervising attorney. And right now, I supervise 11 attorneys over five counties. Um, we have 1,900 children that we are appointed to um, who uh, have allegations of abuse, abandonment, and neglect. And the majority of the cases that we deal with is due to, unfortunately, the drug crisis that we have going on in our country. And I will say, really, um, there have been attempts to try to keep these children with their families, and it just hasn't worked. So what, if anything, do you think is the most important part of your job? Mm. So I think our presence is the most important part because we are the focus of the child in the courtroom. There are generally four to five other parties in the courtroom. So mom will have her attorney. There may be one or, one or more fathers, depending on the number of children or depending on if there's just one father for all the children. So they'll have their attorneys. The Department of Children and Family will have their attorneys and we are in court representing the best interests of the child. And there could be an attorney at litem in certain cases representing the child as well. But in most cases, it's, it is the guardian ad litem program and our focus really is on the child. While everyone else is focused on the family or the parents, which they are supposed to be, we get to singularly focus on what is best for this child. Um, and as frustrating as it can be sometimes, it is such a privilege. I'm heavy again. Oh, heavy again. you shouldn't because <laughs> It is a privilege. That's all I can say. I feel so privileged to be in an area of law where I really get to be myself and to really allow my passion to show. But, you know, again, it, it is public interest law <laughs> and all, the, all that goes on with that. All right. Is there anything else that you just want to tell us that's on your heart? I think I've really covered it. I, I, I do, I do have to just whenever I'm telling my story, include the beautiful souls of my grandmothers. They are so a part of my story. They, their sacrifice, their love for me. Is so a part of why I'm here um, and my faith too. And I think it's important for people to hear someone who has a Juris Doctor. I believe I'm doing well <laughs> in my profession and I want to say that humbly. Also be okay with faith. Um, they're not opposites. And going back to this again, just run your own race. And if you run it in a skirt or run it in pants or with ballet shoes or tennis shoes or with a tiara on, just find the area of law that you were created to do and be at peace with that. 
and, and know how impactful that's going to be because there are people who are at corporate 500 companies who are doing wonderful work there for those companies. And there's people at the public defender's office doing wonderful work for defendants. And it's just okay. I think when we have competitive environments, we make one area better than the other, and that's just not the case. That was a beautiful wrap up. Thank you so much for your time, Ms. Rochelle. Thank you.